the importance of one decision. Decisions are vital in life. And this morning, I'm just going to really, it'll be a little bit different. I'm going to tell a story. How many like stories? Not a bedtime story. Some of you want to go to sleep. This is a Bible story on the importance, and really it's written and given to us as many stories in the Bible. And I could bring, and there are many testimonies this way. The importance of one decision altering the course of your life. The importance of one decision making an impact. As we talked of last week, how many of you believe, as the scriptures are very clear, even one decision impacts eternity? We talked about that last week when we studied Genesis chapter 3, that the decision of Adam and Eve, just Adam alone, changed the course of all the world. Decisions are very important. It's something that God's given to us, a choice. This morning, we're going to go to Genesis 13 and read the story of a man named Lot. Now, Lot was the nephew of Abraham, who's sort of Abraham before. Abraham's very vital in, the, in Scripture. And uh, he started a new nation. God used Abraham mightily and greatly. Abraham came out of the land of Ur, and there was a family member that came with him. His name was Lot. And Lot was blessed by God because Abraham was blessed by God. Abraham was blessed because he obeyed God. And everything that Abraham did, he did to honor and serve and follow God. The Bible calls Abraham the father of faith. Abraham had faith. He believed in God. He trusted in God. God directed his life, his way. Wonderfully, Lot was with him. As we pick up our story in Genesis 13, Abraham had been blessed so greatly that he was called, at this time, the richest man on earth. Now, just because you're the richest man on earth doesn't mean you've been blessed by God, but Abraham was at this point. And Lot had been blessed mightily. Lot had servants, and Lot had a whole business and an empire. He had his own animals and camels and sheep and oxen. And he was, well, they got so large, they were starting to have trouble. We're going to notice it in Genesis 13, verse number 7. Let's all stand as we read this passage, and then we will have a seat. It says in verse number 7, There was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes. And he beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And Lord, we're going to see as we look to your word a passage that you have given to us as a passage of admonition and understanding and of learning. I know, Lord, that we, can, we could probably hear many testimonies today of somebody who has made a wrong decision and came back later in life to regret it. Oh, Lord, today, wherever we are, wherever our families are, I pray, Lord, for wisdom today to not make the decision that we will later regret, a decision that can destroy and harm many years decades of life, and even family members because of it. Lord, give us wisdom today as we need wisdom to make the right choices. Lord, wisdom only comes from you. Help me to not be so proud to think that my way is best. Help me to be humble to say, Lord, you're right, 
And Lord, I'll follow you because your path is the path that leads to life and life more abundant. And Lord, would we look at the choice made by Lot here as a lesson of what not to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you will. This is a sad story, and we're going to get to where it goes. If you know the story of Lot, you'll know that Lot made a bad decision. What it was is they were, having, they were, they were blessed so greatly that they had to separate Lot from Abraham, and Lot began, and, and they began to split. Abraham came humbly and said, Lot, whichever way you choose, I'll go the opposite way. I'm not going to get first pick. I'll humbly submit. You choose one way, I'll go the other. We need to create some uh, land and area for us. And Lot chose, you can see in your notes here, Lot beheld the plain of Jordan. And he looked how beautiful the plain was. It was a more flourishing area. It was a more profitable area. It, per, it was a more financially beneficial area. It was closer toward the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. At this time, some of the largest, most prosperous cities in the whole world. And he said, you know what? This, for my future, looks like the best way. And I want you to notice where he ends up. The Bible, of second, the Bible in the end of the New Testament references this man, Lot. Because Lot not only pitches his tent towards Sodom, we're going to find later on he ends up in Sodom. Later on, he is a leader. He is elected as a leader of Sodom. And what happens by the end of this story, Lot loses his children, his sons, his daughters, and the men that they marry. He loses his wife. He loses all that he owns. And it ends tragically. He only has two daughters with him, and his two daughters begin, well, they do some things that are pretty horrific. They get their father a lot drunk, and they sleep with him, getting pregnant with their own father. And Lot's life is a sad testimony of somebody who was righteous. Look at what it says in 2 Peter. This was a righteous man. It says in 2 Peter 2, verse 6, and, he, and God turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those who should live ungodly. And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, Lot, dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, it vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And so, how did, God, how did Lot get from blessed to vexed? One decision. And it starts with this very first important point. We have to notice Lot's direction. Do you see Lot's direction as you, as you notice in the scriptures? The Bible tells us that Lot's direction, he chose in verse 11... The plain of Jordan, not a, bad, not a bad thing, but this phrase is interesting at the end of verse number 12. It says he pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the next verse gives us some clarity. But the men of Sodom were wicked before the Lord, exceed, and, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Someone once said it this way, D direction determines your destiny. Where you will end up is determined by what direction you go. If you get on the interstate and you say, I'm just going to go and drive for a few hours in a direction, I, I will know where you will end up or thereabouts if you tell me what direction you start heading, right? If you say, I'm going to go south on I-65 for eight hours, I can kind of guess where you're going to end up. And it won't be the same as if you go north for eight hours, right? Or if you go east for eight hours. My truckers are now discussing, all right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrible if you spent eight hours going the wrong direction? That'd be rough, wouldn't it? You know what's more tragic? People going years in the wrong direction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This story of Lot is given for our example today. A righteous man, a man who believed in God, a great man of faith, and it all went south because of Lot's direction. He 
he began by leaving Abraham. By the way, I think that was a mistake. And I think it was a mistake to begin to pitch his tent toward Sodom. So let's look at the two errors here. First, I, I want you to say he moved away from a spiritual man. Now, the Bible indicates that Lot himself was a righteous man, a just man. It, it, it indicates that in the New Testament. However, he moved away from Abraham. Abraham no longer was his counsel. Abraham no longer was with him. Abraham no longer was there instructing and helping him. I believe every Christian needs people that they listen to and are with because they need counsel. We have to be with somebody and trust that they're telling us what we need to hear. Someone said this quote, nearness is likeness. I can tell everybody what you will be like in 10 years by who you hang around today. Who you are near, you will eventually be like. I can often tell when people start moving a direction because they are hanging around. They must be listening to somebody. You will only be different by who you hang around and who you are reading. You guys with me on that one? And nowadays it's yeah. whose podcast you're listening to. And, 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 and Lot just began moving in direction. How many of you see that Mark, Mark, Lot had a heart. I'm, I'm trying to combine words there. <laughs> Who's Lark? Lot had a heart. You come up here and do it. All right? <laughs> Here, you're laughing at me. Here. <laughs> I apologize. Lot, can you see it in Lot's heart? Lot had a heart or a desire for the things of Sodom. Yeah. And, and I, I would say, I don't think that he was desiring the bad things in Sodom. Right. Personally, I don't think that. Now, we'll never know because it's hard to judge a heart, but I don't think Lot was saying, you know what? I want to go live the wicked life in Sodom. In fact, the Bible says he lived it and he was vexed from day to day while he was in it. But there was something alluring about Sodom, that wicked city, and it was known even at the time, that is a wicked city, but it was, it was prosperous. It had opportunities. And Lot had something in his heart that was pulling him that direction. We don't know exactly what it was that was drawing him. I don't think that's important in the story because God doesn't say. And it doesn't really matter what is drawing us to making a bad decision or what's drawing us toward that wrong company or toward that worldly influence. It doesn't matter what it is that's drawing us. What matters is that you will be like who you are near. Nearness is likeness. And it's why the Bible teaches a principle from the Old Testament all the way through the end of the New Testament. It's called the, the, uh, the doctrine of separation. God could have called Abraham to stay in the land of Ur with his family, yes? Yep. But God said, I want to separate you, Abraham, unto, uh, away from them and unto me. And there's a doctrine of separation. Look at it. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Proverbs 9, verse 6. I really encourage you to come on Wednesdays. We study the book of Proverbs. Forsake the foolish and live. Go in the way of understanding. And if Lot could have just said, Lot, your direction is wrong. It, not, it may not look wrong today, but you fast forward a decade down the road, you're going to see that you're now far different in a far different place than you were. Not only was he away from a spiritual man, and I would encourage you to find somebody who is, who is where you want to go. Here's some great wisdom. This was given to me a long time ago, and it, it's been one of my primary themes in life. Listen to the people who already have been where you want to go. Amen. So if I want to be financially in a position, a certain position, I go to somebody who has been there and done that. Yeah. You know how many, you know many broke people listen to broke people <laughs> with how to spend money? You know how many people who don't have 
successful homes, relationships, marriages are going to people that don't also have successful homes and marriages for advice? Yeah. I, always, I was always bothered by this. When I was in college, all the guys would gather around and talk about how, how women think and how to date women, and none of them had dates. <laughs> we call them the dateless wonder group. They were the experts on women. I thought that funny, right? Before, before people have children, they always want to write a book on how to parent. <laughs> Maybe you were there. I thought I was there. But the wisdom is to look at somebody and say, they've done it. Yep. And to say, how did you do it? I love getting together with folks and saying, you've been married this many years. What, what, what's the secret sauce? Like, like what, what, what do I need to hear? What, you, had, you had how many children and they all turned out for God? What did you do? We caution them. There's a whole host of people that say, you know what? I know I grew up in blessing. I'm greatly blessed because of it. Lot being one of them. But I want to try things differently. Okay. I've heard people use that excuse. And what happens is, most often is a lot story happening. Where later on it's like, um, yeah, you, you were better off not going that direction. At the time it looked a little bit... Like an opportunity. So be careful who you're from. And then next, he pitched toward the wicked culture. You notice, I don't think he was subscribing to the wickedness. I think Lot would tell you. I, 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 was, not, I was not going there because it was wicked. But that is the problem, though. If you're moving toward the wicked culture, that will show later on. It will have detrimental effects in our life. So that, this is wisdom here today. Lot looked down to the Jordan Valley. It was a lush garden spot. In that valley, there were five little cities. And then there were two big ones. The two big ones were Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think he wanted to be in Sodom and Gomorrah maybe right away. I think he pitched his tent toward it. He was probably in one of the surrounding smaller villages. Lot was intrigued by the thought of prosperity. I do believe Lot was intrigued by the thought of popularity. We're going to see later on, he goes along with all the wickedness because he's an elected leader. He wanted authority. By the way, if you crave authority, the devil will give it to you. Yeah. But it will cost you your life. It will cost you your family. I can't tell you how many people in Hollywood, I've said this before, grew up in Christian homes in Baptist churches. And you know what they were offered? And they took it. And their lives are far more empty because of it. And their reach and their purpose are non-existent. Did you notice how many people, how many people in Hollywood got up and told people what, who to vote for and how many people listened? Nobody cares what people who pretend for a living think. Nor should they. I would, I would seriously not want to take the advice of people in Hollywood to how to have your life in perfect harmony. Find somebody that is where you need to be. And I will tell you, stay away from the wicked, the wicked culture. Many men will set a wrong direction spiritually by primarily focusing on their careers, their jobs, and their finances. And God will be filled in later. That's what Lot did. Folks, God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the other things will be added unto you. Abraham was an example of that. And I could tell you, folks, Every person who puts God to the test is an example of that. You've got to trust God. And that is, that is what Lot did not do. He pitched his tent towards Sodom, the direction of Sodom. The Bible says in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, Pastor, I'm not getting counsel from the ungodly. If you're getting counsel from somebody that you don't want to be like, I'm just sad that I'm here to tell you, you will be like them if you listen to their counsel. So go to somebody who is what you want, and that's who you get counsel from. All right. Okay? The suicidal people you should not be getting counsel from. If, like, 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 like there's just a, a part of that. And, and the Bible says, blessed if you don't walk in their counsel. Next, nor standeth in the way of sinners. That means the direction that the wicked are going, don't, don't join them in that direction. Don't be in that way. 
nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Scorners are people who openly mock the word of God. If you have close relations to people who openly mock the word of God, that will spill into your heart. Did you hear me on that? Yeah. If, you have, if you have people who openly question the word of God, that will spill into you. That's why there's a blessing for those who aren't a part of that. The Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. One of the best things my parents did for me growing up between the years of when I was born until the years I was old enough to get out on my own is they required that we learned God's word in school, at church, and at home. And they required that I stay away from anybody who disagreed with God's word. What, that's, been the great, that's been the great blessing in my life. And that, that Psalm chapter 1 blessing applies. Now I could, you know, we can decide, I can decide this week to do what Lot did. So first Lot stood in the way of sinners. He just, it's not a big deal, pastor, if I just, I'm not in Sodom. I'm not sinning like the Sodomites. But I'm just going that direction. You'll never become a drunkard if you don't take a first drink. You'll never become immoral if you do not commit fornication. Now, I'm not doing this to, to scold those who have struggled with that, but I can probably bring a lot of testimonies up here that say, don't start down the road because that does not end well. It's best to say, Lord, we'll stay away from everything in the wicked culture. Some people call that crazy. That's crazy. You won't even do this. I think it's crazy to dabble in the wicked culture. I don't think that has much down the road sight. So the direction meant only in Lot's life, not only the loss of his wealth, but the loss of the souls of his family. So I want you to notice, first of all, I want you to notice Lot's direction. Lot's what? Lot's Always find, this is more important than what you believe today. It's what your direction is, where your arrow is pointed today. You say, Pastor, I'm a better Christian because I do this and check these boxes than so-and-so. But if so-and-so's direction is pointed toward Christ and yours is pointed toward a wicked culture, folks, I'm just telling you right now, it's more important where is your heart pointed. And that's why many times, even if, even if we said always, I'll always come down, like where's your focus? Where are you, we pointed at? What, where's your heart? Number two, Lot's devotion. Lot's devotion. Lot's devotion. He was not only had the wrong direction, his wrong direction eventually spilled into his devotion. Just as direction determines your destiny, so also does your devotion. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So wherever you're pointed and start investing, eventually your devotion will follow. He had... Do you have your Bibles in Genesis? Go to chapter 14. So we're going to flip over to chapter number 14. We find, as the passage of time goes, chapter 14, verse number 12, we find Lot now is devoted to the city of Sodom. It says they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and all his goods, and they departed Lot was actually taken captive. His family was taken captive because he was now a part of the city of Sodom. Abraham actually comes and rescues him. And when Abraham rescues Lot, guess where Lot goes right back to? Right back to Sodom. His heart was there. He couldn't get out of it. And eventually your direction will turn into devotion. The simple direction of his life changed to devotion. Lot was taken into captivity. I will say this, devotion to sin will always bring bondage. I think that's the lesson here. There is no such thing as just dabbling or playing with sin. It will become a problem. The Bible says, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that's dead is freed from sin. So Abraham comes and rescues Lot, and Lot immediately re returns to Sodom, and I say, not smart. That should have been a wake-up call. You know, I'm amazed how many people in life 
fly right through the red stop light that God puts up. God puts a wake-up call. Warning! Warning! That was a warning. He got, captive, he got taken captive in Sodom. Abraham rescues him. And you know what he should have done? I'm sticking with you from now on, Abraham. You know what he went to? Right back to Sodom. That was God saying, Lot, warning. I, we just don't know when the last time a warning comes before it gets real bad. Yeah. And that's why we cannot play the game. By the way, God is merciful. He is long-suffering. And many times man takes advantage of that. But be careful. God puts up the warning sign. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Amen. We've got to come to Christ and say, Lord, I trust you and you alone. And maybe God has revealed himself. He's shown that he's God. Be careful that you just don't run through that stoplight. So we see his devotion for the city. Number two, letter B, we see his... Oh, that was the point. I've already done with that. We see the devotion for the city. Number... Well, I'll give you a second to write it in. That's your notes there. Then next we see his dedication to the city. Take your Bibles and flip to chapter 19 of Genesis. Now he is in a place of prominence. Now he's not just living in the city. He is an elected official for the city of Sodom. Boy, he was in a place of prominence. He had a bench. He had an actual bench seat. That's what it's talking about in, 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 uh, for Lot. The Bible says he sat in the gate. That literally meant he had a place of prominence in the city. Now, he had a place of prominence. Now, I don't believe Lot was doing any wickedness, but I think that Lot was in a city and passing laws and being okay with the wickedness in that city. And the Bible talks about uh, the, sodom, the sodomy that was happening in chapter 19. This isn't, a, this isn't a sermon against homosexuality, but you can read it very clearly in Genesis chapter 19, starting in verse number 4, that the men of the city, two angels come into Lot's house, and the men of the city bang the door down to try to have intimate relations with these angels. Um, and it was not a proper thing. And this sodomy was deemed wicked in the word of God. You can read in your notes from Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament talking about this. And in Leviticus chapter 18, verse number 22. I remember growing up, pastors used to warn back in the 90s, way back. Pastors used to warn, say, there's coming, there's coming a an, an time when marriage will not just be between a man and a woman. It will be between people of the same gender. And um, that was almost unthinkable 30 years ago. We've come a long ways, not only in 30 years, but even in 10 years and even in five years, we've come a long way. People used to warn of that. This morning's message is not a moment of warning, but we, have, we are in store for a lot worse if we continue the direction we're going. And while the church must be prayerful in hopes for all sinners to be saved, we actually are only hastening the judgment of God when we put our approval on something that God declares to be wrong. And it does, it does, it, it does fly flat in the face of God's word when we fly a rainbow flag outside of churches now. And I'm not, I'm not judging people, but God said that is a sin. And I want to tell you today that God's judgment is coming. It's something that must be preached with mercy and with love and with grace, showing that Jesus Christ is the answer. So I want you to see, first, second of all, we see Lot's devotion. And then let, let's conclude the story with where Lot ends up, shall we? Genesis chapter 19. We're going to read, let me just read a little bit, because number three is Lot's destination. This is heartbreaking. Really, this is just me telling this story biblically. It says in verse 1, There came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you. Come into thy servant's house and tarry all night. Wash your feet, rise up early, and then go on your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the streets all night. And Lot pressed them greatly, and they turned into him, and they entered into his house. And he made them a feast and baked them unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, 
the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And of course, that's, uh, that's a sexual in nature. Verse 6 says, And Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now. Now notice what Lot does. This is unfathomable to me as a man. Anybody have daughters in this room today? I have four. I want you to just think of how Lot, how does Lot even think this way? Look at what Lot does in verse number eight. Behold now, I know you want to have sex with these. I'm a, they're, they're innocent. I'm going to protect them. But look at, I have two daughters which have not known a man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as it is good in your eyes. What? How many think Lot has lost his marbles? Sounds a lot like a lot of people today who've lost their marbles. Have sex with anybody? Anytime, anywhere, any place? Casual sex, the idea of it has ruined this generation. There is no such thing as casual sex. It's made for one man and one woman in the bounds of marriage and marriage alone. And it is holy, it is righteous, it is undefiled, the Bible says. But notice, this is where Lot's mind is already at. Once a righteous man, a just man. What are you doing, Lot? What are you doing? Verse number nine. They said, stand back. The people that are outside, stand back. And they came again. Well, the, the men, verse number 10, the angels put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house and shut the door. And the angels smote the men that were at the door with blindness small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Verse number 12, the men said unto Lot, Hast thou anything here besides sons-in-laws, sons, daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in this city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law. So he has some daughters that are already married, right? He goes and speaks to his married daughters and to his sons-in-laws. He begins to beg them, you got to get out of here. God's going to destroy it. In verse 14, when Lot went out and spake to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and he said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this place. He seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They, la they thought, <laughs> this is funny. Great joke, old man Lot. They find that Lot had his own family mocking him when he actually told them the truth. Look at verse 23. Let's jump down to 23. Finally, they get out of there. The sun was risen from on the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. And the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and the inhabitants of the cities, that which grew on the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt. Now, it was told by the angels, just in the verses here, flee the city, get out, don't look back. Lot's wife disobeyed, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Much I could teach on this particular lesson. One boy was hearing this story in a Sunday school class. His teacher said, you guys won't believe it. One day, Lot's wife looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. And Johnny said, that's no big deal. Just yesterday, my mom looked back and she turned right into a telephone pole. <laughs> it wasn't that kind of looking back, but uh, the Lord actually had some of this. You can read later in the chapter what his daughters do as they're now living in a... The Bible says that they're destitute. They have nothing. They're poor. The Bible says they're living in an actual cave. Lot and his two daughters that he pulled out of the city and his, lot, his two daughters do some wicked wicked things. I want you to see a couple things Lot lost. Letter A, he lost his family respect. His family respect was gone. They would no longer listen to him. You, you dabble with the world long enough, your family will not listen to what you have to say. I find that Abraham's son, whose name was Isaac, you remember Isaac? Isaac was 40 years old. He was still unmarried. He was still single. And Abraham said, you will not get a wife around here. 
son, I'm going to send my servant. He'll go pick you out a wife. Now, how many of you, that sounds like a perfect plan there, okay? All the dads go, yeah. Probably better. <laughs> but I didn't want my parents picking out my How many of you know Isaac listened to his dad? How many of you know Isaac was greatly blessed because of it? We see a difference in opinion from the children. When Lot says something, they... <laughs> you want us to leave this? That's a, what a great joke, Lot. We're not leaving. And you know Lot's married daughters and sons-in-law died in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because Lot lost his family's respect. He lost it because he dabbled with the world. Maybe Lot said, I'm a righteous guy, but his life didn't back it up. A hypocrite can be defined as someone who complains when there's too much sex and violence in the world, even though it can be found on his own DVR. When Dr. Richard Halverson was with the U.S. Senate, he was the U.S. US Senate's chaplain in the early 2000s, he spoke before a group of evangelicals. And this group of evangelicals had gathered at Congress and they were protesting the inactivity, Congress's inactivity on disallowing the school prayer in the public schools, prayer in the public schools. They were irritated that Congress had not acted with any strong initiative to restore prayer in the public schools. To these that were seeking a greater initiative from the government, Dr. Richard Halverson asked in a public forum, he asked, how many of you protesting here today have prayed with your children this month outside of a church setting? Not one family member raised their hand. And so he said, spiritual initiative starts in the home, not in Congress. I'm here to tell you today, revival does not start by who was elected on Tuesday. Revival happens in our homes. Amen. And we can whine about prayer not being in the public schools, but is prayer in your home, madam and sir? Are you taking time to spend praying and seeking God's faith, face as a family? I'll tell you, Lot did not. Abraham did. So it wasn't just his direction. It caused his whole premise, his whole family's, I guess you could say, their primary objective was lacking. Letter B, his, family, his, his friends were lost. Imagine all the friends and connections, all the people and all the money, the wealth, the prestige, the fame that he had made while in Sodom. He lost it. Letter C, his family members were even lost. Of course, we read that in verse 26, chapter number 19. There's a small verse I want you to, it's an easy verse to, rem, to memorize. In Luke chapter 17, verse 32, Jesus says this. It's, it's, it's a three-word verse. You can memorize it. Ready? Remember Lot's wife. A lot can be preached from those three words. Remember Lot's wife. He lost his own marriage. A Christian school teacher I knew growing up, wonderful man, a most wonderful family, and even to this day I could testify what a, what a great example and a man of God. His, he was a Christian school teacher. He still is, actually, to this day. He's very up there in years, but his life verse is Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. See, we've got to remember what we, what we stand to lose. If I could take Lot, and of course it's easy to sit back and play Monday morning quarterback, right? How many of you ever played Monday morning quarterback? Well, you don't understand it because that's a sports analogy. It's when you go, that quarterback should have done. Well, if only you could have called him the day before and told him. <laughs> right? Hindsight is 2020, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I could go back and say, Lot, if only you would have. But you know, I believe that we have to whole lot of families here, mine included, that if we make some wrong decisions,
decisions and directed 2024 and 2025. I wish we could have premature wisdom and say, I'll follow the Lord and trust in his way. Lastly, family morals were lost. That's verse 30 through 33. Verse 30 through 33 of chapter number 19 talks about what happens. God actually has a curse upon Lot's lineage because Lot's children, his only two remaining children, his only two remaining daughters, have children by their father. And the Bible says that they had the Moabites and the Ammonites. How many of you have been here on Sunday nights? We've been studying Jonah. How many remember the Ammonites? The Moabites. Moabites are big in the Old Testament. They were huge problems to Israel, and they still are to this day. And they were caused as a result of what happened to Lot. God had a curse upon that family. And I'm just telling you, folks, I don't know about you. I don't want my children to be cursed because of one decision I make. And we make decisions so lightly, do we not? We just cast them aside like, well, this is what I want to do. And this is what I feel good about. And you know what? This is where my, be- my best financial opportunity is. And we don't consider the Lord in all our thoughts. We yeah. don't come and ask God, God, what would you want me to do? Before a major decision, we don't go and get counsel, biblical, spiritual counsel from godly people who are where we want to go. And I'm just cautioning you. Because, folks, let me just tell you a story. Growing up in the church, I grew up in, a, in, the, in the church I was saved in, saved at the church. I was four years old, baptized in the church when I was five years old. Called to preach in the church. I told folks I was going to be a preacher. I, came to, I, I went to camp at 13, came back and said, I'm going to preach the gospel. Surrendered. Became a assistant pastor at that church. I served in every ministry in the church. I became an assistant pastor in the church. I then became, we started a Christian school. I became the Christian school principal in the church. I thought for sure, I thought for sure, this is where God's going to have me my whole life. And then, some things started to change. The pastor that was there began to change some of the doctrines and principles. And he made no bones about it. He said, we are changing our philosophy. We are going to change our direction. We're going to change where we're going to go. Now, I, I was sitting there, and I had to see where we wanted to end up. Because I said, where are we going to go? This point is new direction. That's fine. But where does this direction end up? I spent many, many long nights with my wife talking and praying and weeping together. I won't get into exactly what the issue is, but it was on a Sunday night. Tears were streaming down my face. I could not compose myself because I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me. You've got to walk that aisle. This was the hardest aisle walk I've ever had to do. Because I had to set flames to all my dreams, hopes, and goals in life in Illinois. I had to tell the pastor, who I was full-time at the, at the, at the church, I had a free, par- a free house to live in. I had to tell him I resigned. Trusting that God would provide. That was hard. Now, I can tell you that that man who was my, more than my pastor at that time, we've had conversations. And he said, Ben, I wish I would have done it completely differently. His oldest son, I think he was best friends with David in school, does not believe in the word of God we have there. In fact, does not believe that Jesus Christ actually walked this earth. not to your own understanding. If in all thy ways you acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
it shall be health to thy navel and marrow unto thy bones. The Bible tells us this story for a reason. This, this may just land upon where you're at in life, but it doesn't matter what stage you're at in life. You might, you might agree with this and say, Lord, I've been where the prodigal son was, and I can tell you it's no fun. Someone might be up here and say, I lived where Lot was, and I lost my family, and I lost, my, I lost this in my relationship. I'm not here to, to knock you today, because if you come tonight, God's the God of a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a fifth chance. And a sixth chance, God will use where you're at today and make a beautiful tomorrow. But right. you've got to trust in the Lord. Right. Lots of an example of what we all stand to lose with one bad choice. It starts with the direction. That direction will turn into devotion. And a wrong devotion will end up in destruction. Maybe there's someone in here that has never trusted Christ as their Savior. Folks, you have to come to that first place where you have to humbly say, the Lord is right, I am wrong. Because mm -hmm. you can never admit that your way is not the best way, but God knows all. See, the Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, seeing things not seen. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It starts with faith. If you have faith enough to believe that God knows best for your life. Abraham had to do that. He's the father of faith. Lot said, I want to kind of chart my own way and my own course. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, yep. but there ends thereof are the ways of death. Lot could have said, how did I get here? Where did I go wrong? And I'll tell you, it first started when he separated from those who were having the blessing of God. And it started, and it, it continued as he was seeking the direction of the world. So let me just ask today, where are you at in your heart, your direction? If you've never trusted Christ, it starts there. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner, not deserving of heaven, but I accept your salvation full and free. Do you know that it doesn't matter what we've done, we call on Jesus Christ, and he will save. Amen. I love that part. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his tender mercies. He saved us. He washed us. He will regenerate us and give us a newness of life. I'm thankful for the day I was saved. If you've never trusted Christ, today's the day you need to make that decision. That will alter your eternity. But if you're on the verge of an important decision, I encourage you, look down the road. Go get some biblical, godly counsel. I'm not talking about going and getting counsel from the world. By the way, psychologists, they have some good things, but a majority of them are seeing psychologists. They said the number one group of people in the world that need psychological help are the profession of psychologists. I'm not going to go listen to people who are trying to blow their brains out about how not to blow your brains out. I'm going to go to the people who have the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. And so your direction and devotion determines your destination. Maybe there's a worldly association that you just need to decide. That's out. Whatever your decision is today, I don't know how this could be of help. Maybe just as a warning. Hey, remember Lot's wife. Lord, I come today, and Lord, it's a story that is serious in Scripture. It's a story that has personal teachings to myself in my own life, in my own heart. For at any moment, Lord... I can become the rebel in the story of the prodigal son. At any moment, Lord, you have been, by the way, you have, Lord, blessed me greatly. I believe I've had more blessings in my life than Lot or even Abraham did in his. But I'm going to tell you, Lord, at any point, I can make the decisions of Lot. And I can move a direction. I can have a devotion that is not where you want me to set my heart. Oh, Lord, if our people today would love you with all of our heart and with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Even as your head is bowed and your eyes closed, if you just pray to the Lord, I want everyone in here today to talk to God. And ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want from me in relation to that message that was preached?
Or is there a direction that my heart is going? Well, there needs to be a decision. You say, Pastor Ben, uh, like the prodigal son, many years I've wandered far from God. It's time to come home. You say, Pastor Ben, I need to trust Christ as my Savior today. I don't know, I'm going to embarrass you. I'm, I'm be excited for you. I'll promise I'll pray for you. You say, Pastor Ben, I need to trust Christ. I can see that hand. Is there anybody else? I need to trust Christ as my Savior today. Maybe you say, Pastor Ben, there's a decision that I need to make. It's a, maybe, maybe a big one. Maybe it's not so big, but I need to get some counsel from someone on that one. I need to hear what God has to say. Thank you for that hand and for that hand. Any other? You say, Pastor, i got a direction. Two, three, four more of you. God what he wants. Maybe that's maybe there's another step beyond that. Maybe there's a wrong association that you know is not good for you or your family. You say, Pastor Ben, help me to separate from that as Lot should have separated from Sodom. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? That's just separation that I need to have. There's another one. There's two more. There's some separation. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You say, Pastor Ben, I just need wisdom. Maybe it's just something as simple as, Lord, over my choices, help me to seek you first. Boy, that's a simple one I think we can all get on board with. You say, Pastor Ben, before I make decisions, help me to seek the face of the Lord. Help me to seek his word and help me to seek what God wants more than I seek what I want. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Hands all over the room. I don't, there's hardly any hands that aren't. Lord, you saw the hands, but more importantly, you saw the hearts. Let's all stand to our feet. Brother, Brother Warren, if you'd begin playing, if you'd like to come to an altar to seal that decision and call on the Lord, I just have a heart for you. I don't want you to end up like Lot. Maybe the Lord's just reminding you, putting up one last stop sign saying, hey, before you hit it, before you fly through this intersection, before you make that choice, let's make sure we seek God's face. Even in your seat, would you call on the Lord? Just pray in your heart and say, Lord, lead me in the way that I should go. Help me to have a yielded, moldable heart like Abraham. Where the Lord just hints, get up and go and leave and do. And I'll say, Lord, I'm following. I'm yielding. The Lord can work with somebody who is yielded. There's unlimited blessings that are there. But if you demand your way like Lot, do not, do not be surprised if it ends similarly to Lot. Remember Lot's wife. 